stuff we kind of led into that and we'll lead into Wednesday's Wednesday stuff today as well but any questions okay so where were we at on Friday on Friday we talked about taking and at the end we said okay let's take this molecule and let's add like HCl or HBr to it and so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to protonate the oxygen which way does the arrow go from what to what from oxygen to H plus okay if you did not do that when you get your exam back that's a habit you're going to want to break immediately um, it always goes towards the positive charge so that's going to give us our oxonium ion and then the water is going to leave to then give us this allylic carbocation. And the theme for this, well, the theme for the first part of this chapter, which is now what, 19, is allylic carbocations and also allylic radicals, which we can talk about a little bit as well. Um, but it's the allylic carbon. The allylic carbon is special because it will allow you to draw resonance structures. And so what I would do is I would take this pair of electrons, move it here to form a second resonance structure like that. And then I will always ask you to write the resonance hybrid of those. And so in writing the resonance hybrid, we're going to go back and we're going to basically do what we do with transition states. We're going to average charges, average bonds. So in this case, and, and there is an easier way to look at the average of the charges. Everywhere there's a positive charge in the resonance structures, there's going to be a delta positive charge in the hybrid. So that puts two delta positive charges there. And then in terms of your average bonds, we would look at that and say for the first bond here, it's going to be, for this first bond, we're going to have single single average single double single average partial double double single partial double so we're going to have basically the pot, the partial partial double bonds and the in this in the next chapter the partial double bonds will always be in between the delta positive charges if you're looking for like a pattern recognition, that's what will happen. So that's my resonance hybrid. And so the difficulty here is that the resonance hybrid is a true structure. But the question is, where's the Cl minus going to add? And if we wanted to add the Cl minus to the two delta positive charges, the question is, if I add it to the delta positive charge on the right, where's the double bond go? If I add it to the one that's kind of in the middle, where does the double bond go? And so using the delta positives and using the um, using these uh, delta using the partial bonds doesn't necessarily make it easy to write the product. So what we're going to do is we're going to treat each resonance structure as if it's a true, it's the true structure. So I'm going to take my Cl minus. And I'm going to add it to that carbocation, and I'm going to take my other Cl minus, and I'm going to add it to that carbocation to get my two products. So this isn't this isn't really, you know, the best way to do this because those two are not real structures. But this way we'll be able to figure out where the double bond goes with minimal amount of effort. So that means that my two products are going to be having the chloride there and then having the chloride there. 
so those are my two products. And if there was another double bond in place, which will be for next for the next chapter, then I could write a third resonance structure. So the idea here is I'm delocalizing the positive charge. So now the question is, I've got two. I've got two products. Which one's the major product? And this is where we left off on Friday, saying, "Well, it depends." What do you mean it depends? Well, there's two ways to look at this. Looking at the products, we've done reactions in the past where we've said, okay, the major product is the most stable product. Now, when I look at these two, when I look at these two, have we ever had a rule about alkyl halides as to which one is more stable? Just the alkyl halide itself. No, we haven't. If you haven't forgotten anything, we've never had that rule. We've never said a primary is more stable or less stable than a secondary because that's not a rule. We do have a rule, though, that they're, they're double bonds. So which one of these two would be the more stable double bond? The one on the... We agree? The one on the right because it's more <coughs> substituted. So this is going to be the more stable product. Okay, so again, my, my rule about the stability here is I can only use a rule that I have. And our rule is double bonds, more substituted, more stable. But you could also make the argument that for the two intermediates, what kind of intermediate is the top one. So you could make the argument of secondary versus primary. They're both allylic, so that means they're more stable than a run-of-the-mill secondary or a run-of-the-mill primary. What about the role in the double bond in that? Well, here's what we're going to say. The carbocation stability trumps the double bond stability. Right, bless you. So it outweighs the double bond. So it's the carbocation stability. If you have a carbocation and something else, it's primarily the carbocation that is going to make, we're going to make the determination on. So in this case, the secondary and I'll put this again in quotes because it's a secondary allylic, that one would be the more stable intermediate. And then this would be the less stable intermediate. And have we done reactions in the past where the major product has come from the more stable intermediate. And we've done lots of those. Anything involving a carbocation. Markovnikov addition is an example. So we have these two factors that are in play here, and they're opposed to each other. Because the more stable intermediate gives the less stable product and vice versa. So this sets up a situation where the reaction could go either way. It's going to depend on the conditions. And this is one of those things that if you went back in your book, and I think we didn't cover like chapter four last semester in Top Hat, but if you went back there, they foreshadowed this all the way back in chapter four, the idea that reactions can either go through um, the lowest intermediate, the lowest energy intermediate, the most stable one, or they can form the more stable product. Chapter 4 is kind of early for this because it's now chapter 19 in another semester. So, then we didn't go over it. It would have gone to waste anyway because we'd be back talking about it right now. And I would say, but remember back in chapter 40? go, no, no, don't remember that. 
So this is our this is our sort of opposing features: more stable intermediate, more stable product. Which one's going to predominate? Well, let's talk about what it depends on first. So there's really kind of two factors that I'm going to use to change this. And what this means is, what it means is the reaction, the products, the major products depend on the reaction conditions. What it means is I can do one react, I can do the reaction under one set of conditions and get the left product as the major product. But then if I change the conditions, the right one becomes the major product. So it's not, a, it's not a theory, it's a, if I do it under these conditions, this is the major product. If I do it under these other set of conditions, the other one. So I can switch it, which we haven't had that reaction before. We haven't really had a reaction where if I change the conditions, I change the major product. We've had it where you change the reagents and get a different product, but not the conditions. So what are our two conditions that we're going we're gonna to work with? We're going to work with temperature, and we're going to re work with reaction time. Those are going to be our two conditions that we can change. And so there's really kind of two sets of conditions that I can work with, and they're going to have, they're going to have names, and I'll talk about why they're going to have names, because I'm going to draw, we're going to draw the reaction coordinate diagram here for this. And it's going to go on the left, and it's going to go on the right. And we're going to have to get into the gory details of how we can change things. So in terms of temperature and reaction time, we have what are called kinetic conditions. And a kinetic condition is one of low temperature and or short reaction times. So if you use low temperature and or short reaction times, we're going to be doing that reaction under what we call kinetic conditions. And then the opposite is what we would call thermodynamic conditions. And under thermodynamic conditions, we're going to have a higher temperature and or long reaction times. So those are going to be our two sets of conditions that we're going to use. And one is going to lead to one product, and the other set is going to lead to the other product. And the question is why. And why has to do with, the, with, a, with an energy diagram. Okay, so we've got low temperature, short times, or kinetic, and Thermodynamic is high temperature and long reaction times. Okay. Now, just to set this up, what do kinetic conditions favor? Kinetic conditions will always favor, well, yes, they will always favor the product that comes from the more stable intermediate. So when you do a reaction under kinetic conditions, you're going to get the product that comes from the more stable intermediate. And when you do things under the thermodynamic conditions, you're going to get the opposite. You're going to get the product that is the more stable product. So this is going to be a chunk for Wednesday's quiz. Because I'll ask you, what are kinetic conditions? What do they favor? What are thermodynamic conditions? What do they favor? Okay, so that's going to be the first question I ask you on Wednesday. Just so that you, just so that you, we have this uh, down, and it, it, it'll become a little bit more apparent why when we draw out the energy coordinate diagram. Okay. Right. So is everybody kind of with me so far? So I can change the product of this reaction by changing these two conditions. You might say, well, what about low temperature for a long time? Let's not do that. Okay, let's not mix. We're not mixing and matching here. You've got two choices, low temperature, short time, high temperature, long time. We don't mix. Because if you mix, who knows what you'll get. 
because which one of those two predominates, we're not going to go into that. <coughs> so, how do we explain this? Well, here's how we're going to explain this. We're going to explain this by starting off with the resonance hybrid. as the intermediate. Now I have no choice, this is the real structure. So when we think about the ways for the reaction to go, let's say that the Cl minus comes in and adds to the delta plus charge or the Cl minus comes and adds to the other delta plus charge. So the first thing I want to do is I want to write transition states for those two reactions. Okay, I'm going to do one to the right, one to the left. So my first question is, which chloride addition, to the primary or to the secondary, which one do you think will have the lowest transition state energy? And if you want to think of it this way, which one would have a more stable transition state? Adding the chloride to the secondary or adding it to the primary? I'll give you a minute. You can discuss. And then we'll see what your vote is. <laughs> Okay, so it seems like the discussion is sort of over. So again, we'll do ones and twos. One for the adding the chloride to the primary, two for adding it to the secondary. The question is which one will give the more stable transition state or the lowest activation energy? Adding to primary or secondary? Okay. Let me see your numbers. I see mostly twos with a one or one thrown in here and there. So why make an argument for it adding to the secondary delta positive carbon? Because that um, when it would form the secondary cation or secondary carbon cation, it's lower energy. It's more stable, so there's less energy there. True, and what we have to think about is what the transition state is going to look like. Because what I'm because yes, if I had written these two out, one would be more stable than the other. But this is the true structure. So what we have to do is kind of think now about well, how does the delta positive charges play in this? Let me ask a question: The chloride is electron rich. And this goes back to the epoxides. This is a very similar argument that we made for epoxide opening in the triangle. Which carbon is the chloride most likely to add to? Because it's more substituted, which gives it more partial positive charge. So it's more stable for the chloride to add to the more delta positive secondary than it would be to add to the primary. And what we haven't really talked about is, well, what's the effect on the transition state for that? And the effect would be that adding to the primary system would have a higher activation energy than adding to the more substituted, the secondary, because it can have more delta positive charge. So in terms of our transition state energies, going to the left, 
is going to have a lower energy than going to the right. So now, what's this? What am I drawing in here? The activation energies. What's the rule about activation energies and rate? The lower the activation energy, the faster the reaction. How do we know that? We know that because of the Arrhenius equation that says rate equals A times E to the minus EA over RT. So the, so the Arrhenius equation both gives us the relationship of activation energy and temperature, which we know from general chemistry. Heat things up, they go faster, cool them, they go slower. Larger activation energy, slow. Smaller activation energy, faster. So now let's put this in the context of kinetic and thermodynamic and time. Okay. So in terms of doing this reaction for like five minutes, what product am I going to make more of? The product to the left or the product to the right? Left. Because over that time frame, it has, that pathway has a lower activation energy, and so the product on the left is going to form faster. So if I take this reaction and I let it go for five minutes and I measured the amount of products, I would have more left product than right product. That's where the term kinetic comes from. The kinetic product is the product that's formed fastest. So in this case, where is it going to come from? It's going to come from the lowest energy transition state. The lowest energy transition state came from the carbocation that was most stable. And that's what we said earlier. So in this case, what's my final product going to be? My final product on the right is going to be adding the chlorine here with the double bond there. The product, or sorry, on the left, on the right it's going to be that product. So I'm missing, half the, I'm missing half the diagram here, right? Because now let's put in my energies of my final products. So we said which product was more stable, left or right? The right one is more stable because it's more substituted. So let's draw that in at a lower energy. And then this product on the left is less stable. So I'll go ahead and write it in there. And that's not too bad. That's pretty, that's pretty good scale-wise. Okay. So in terms of time, with a short reaction time, which product is going to be formed first? The one on the left, the one that came from the more stable carbocation. Long reaction times, which one is going to be formed more? Really? You said long reaction times? Yeah. Is she? I didn't say anything about temperature yet. I just said reaction times. I just said I just said we're doing long reaction times. I haven't talked about temperature yet. So is it is it going to be the right hand one? How wait, if I form more product over here, how do I get all the way back over there? Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. So if you're sitting there going, "Wait, okay, why is this not the product always?" High or low temperatures? 
Because think about the activation energy. Okay, so I do this at a low temperature, right? If I do this at a low temperature, it's, again, we're back to birds and hikers. If I do this at a low temperature, the molecule has barely enough energy to get over this barrier, the small one, it's going to go over that one much more than the one on the right. So if I lower the temperature down, that's going to happen. But what if I raise up the temperature, what happens? What's the best I could do? Could it jump back over the other side now to the uh, activation energy from the product? Well, let's talk about that in a minute. But just starting here, if I raise the temperature up, what's the best that can happen? The absolute best is 50-50, is right? And in theory, there will always be a little bit more of this because it's a lower activation energy. So we're missing something here. Because I can't switch the major product if the best I can do is 50-50. And what we're missing, what Bobby's alluding to, is that this reaction is reversible. So what makes this reaction reversible? How about I lose the chloride? If I lose the chloride, where do I go? Right back to the intermediate. If I lose the chloride on this side, where do I go? Right back to the intermediate. So these reactions are reversible. We haven't dealt with a situation like that to this point. So just because the product is sitting here doesn't mean that it has to remain here. It could uh, it could overcome an activation energy and get back to the intermediate. Now, the activation energy from product from the product to the reactant is now different. And so now if we think about, well, short reaction time. In a short reaction time, at a low temperature, what's going to happen? I'm going to, low temperature is going to magnify the, the difference in the activation energies, and I'm going to form more of the kinetic product with a short reaction time with a low temperature. The low temperature making this barrier accessible, making the other one a lot less accessible, right? Birds and hikers in energy. So under a short period of time, I'm going to get more of the product on the left, the kinetic product in this case. Now, if we raise the temperature up for a short period of time, the best I can do is 50-50, but let's let the reaction go over a longer period of time. Over a longer period of time, maybe more product starts out on the left, it reverses itself because this barrier is accessible with a high temperature. This thing goes back over to this side, and what happens? That barrier is a lot bigger. So if we adjusted the temperature correctly and the time correctly, we could then force the products to get stuck over here in the thermodynamic side into what we might even call a well, where it gets stuck and it can't come out. So eventually you'll start, or initially you'll start with more kinetic product, but then over time with the high temperature and the long times, it'll reverse itself and you'll get the products, most of the products stuck, or a majority of the product stuck in the thermodynamic well. And so the reason that we have a kinetic and a thermodynamic product in this case is because these reactions are reversible. Once I put the nucleophile onto the allylic position, it could come off. You could say, well, what if this was an OH? Well, how did I get the OH on there? If I react at the alkyl chloride, 
with something like water. I needed acid to get rid of the to get rid of the water. So there's going to be a way to reverse it. So this is why the system is reversible, is because we can start out kinetic, and the the difficult place to get out of is the thermodynamic well. Does that make sense? So on Wednesday, you're going to see the same analysis for a slightly different reaction, but it has the same basic principles. Okay. So let's do a problem. And this is where the this is where counting the number of carbons that you have is incredibly important because I just shorted myself a carbon so that if we did this reaction it wouldn't work. What I would like is I would like this to be a CH2 with a chloride on it. That will work. So what are the products of this reaction going to be? Because ultimately, if I give you this reaction, I'm going to probably say something like this. I'm going to say, okay, write the kinetic product and write the thermodynamic product. And so what you need to do is you need to figure out, well, what are my two products of this reaction? And then which one is kinetic and which one is thermodynamic? Or if I don't even have to say that, I could say short, I could also interchange that and say short time, low temp, or I could say high temp, long time. And what you have to realize is that the short and long are relative terms as are the low and high temperature. So sometimes room temperature is a low temperature if I'm comparing it to like 70 degrees. Minus 40 degrees would be a low temperature compared to room temperature. So I just usually use those terms instead of giving you exact conditions because if I give you 25 degrees, then I have to give you like 70 to show that 25 is low. Could be high as well. Okay, so what are the two possible products of this reaction? What should I do? Okay, I'm going to have the chlorine leave. Did I really want to write that primary carbocation? It's primary bless you, primary and allylic, so it's legit. I can write that primary carbocation as long as it's got a resonance structure, so that's okay. So then what am I going to do? I'm going to write the resonance structure by moving that pair of electrons. Now I'm going to take my H2O. I'm going to add it to the carbocation. And in two steps, I'm going to get the OH here, and if I do the same thing here, H2O in two steps, I'm going to get the OH there.
The two steps being adding the water to form the oxonium ion and then losing the H plus to give me the final alcohol. And if I asked you to do this mechanism for a take home quit or a take home uh, graded homework problem this week, which I will probably on Wednesday, you're going to have to show those steps. So you can't just write down like I did two steps. You're going to have to show the water, the entire water adding, and then. And I don't even have to use water here. I could probably say, oh, well, what about an alcohol? So there's lots of variations on this problem. So if I throw something at you, it's usually like, well, where did you pull that out of? I really didn't. I just, these, there are different variations that are all kind of the same. Same general feature. All right, so we've got A and we got product A and B. So when you get to that point then, now I've got to figure out which one's kinetic, which one's thermodynamic. So which is which? A is, um, A is thermodynamic, B is kinetic. Do we agree with that? If you're unsure, just write, look at the two intermediates. This is the more stable carbocation, and so that's going to lead to the thermodynamic, or sorry, the kinetic product. And double bond, more substituted here, that's going to be the more stable product, that's going to be the thermodynamic product. So before you get to putting the products in the two places, you've got to figure out what they are, and then which one is more stable intermediate, which one's more stable product. Does that kind of make sense? Now, somebody is probably thinking, are they always opposite? Right? Are there any times when they're not, you know, when they're, when the kinetic product might be the same as the thermodynamic product? I mean, that would be a good exception to the rules, right? If you're thinking like me, you're like, that's the one he's going to put on the test. Because you always put the exceptions on. Straightforward. Well, apparently they do at other universities. I usually try and keep to the, the basics. And then maybe <coughs> throw that in. But are there circumstances where the kinetic and thermodynamic product would be the same? Or are there circumstances where you might end not being able to tell? And that would depend on the fact that if you had two secondary carbocations, by our rules, it doesn't matter what group they're attached to. They both would be secondary. You would end up with basically both products under thermodynamic and, and uh, kinetic conditions. So could I make this problem into one of those where there is no kinetic and thermodynamic products, where they're basically the same? Uh, what would I have to do? I'd have to make both carbocations that I got secondary. So maybe maybe if I just said, okay, let's say I use that one to begin with. If I use that one to begin with, what would happen? I would end up with two carbocations that are both secondary. So I would end up with this secondary carbocation and then I would end up with that secondary carbocation. And in this case they have the same stability. And the product's going to have the double bond inside or outside of the ring and if you remember from last semester, I actually, I actually used a modeling program upstairs in my office to figure out which one was more stable, the double bond inside or outside the ring, and they were both equally stable. 
there's only like a kilojoule. There's less than a kilojoule difference between the two, which means they're equally stable. So in this case, because the two carbocations have the same stability and the double bonds have the same substitution, in this case, it means I would get 50-50 regardless of the reaction conditions. So kinetic and thermodynamic mean that I can switch one major product into the other just by changing the conditions. In this case, both sets of those conditions, low temperature, short time, high temperature, long time, all of those would give basically a 50-50 mixture and the product distribution wouldn't matter depending on the conditions. So this is one case where there is no kinetic and thermodynamic product because they're basically the same. The other example is, let's say I get the same product regardless. So here would be, here would be an example with this kind of molecule where I said, you know what, I'm going to use that. And so if I lose my chloride, I'm going to end up with that carbocation. That's going to give as a resonance structure that carbocation. If I added an OH to either one, what would I get? I get the exact same product. So the other place where there is no kinetic and is no thermodynamic product is when you get the same product regardless of the, of the reaction. So there are exceptions, but the, these are boring, right? I want, you to, I want you to be able to write the resonance hybrid. I want you to be able to tell me which one is kinetic and thermodynamic. So in the problems I'm going to give you, they're always going to have a secondary tertiary or primary versus secondary. So that's the basics of kinetics and thermodynamics. Now for Wednesday, all, I'm, all we're going to do here is we're going to start out with two double bonds and we're going to add an H plus to one double bond to make an allylic carbocation and all of this is just going to be the same thing. Okay, so hopefully when you read through that it make, it'll make more sense than on your own. Alright, I've sent out quiz topics, um, exams,